just live in here overnight, <laughs> what would happen? The sleepover episode? Yeah. That would be amazing. Or just go for like tw- a 12 hour conversation <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> At what point do we turn on each other? <laughs> Does it, has anyone got any food? Because I'm starving. <laughs> um, Are you? Yeah. Not, not to the point where I'm going to die, but. Yeah. I've got food in my bag. Oh. The Tim. <laughs> That's my thing, I'm a feeder. <laughs> <laughs> I have to sit and watch you though. <laughs> We're not recording now. I'll, I'll let you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, um, Would I be able to get my headset turned down just a wee tiny bit, please? <coughs> cool. Uh, oh, that's gone. That's gone. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So red. Okay. So I think the the first and most pertinent question is how difficult is it to get Vaseline out of your hair? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was a that was a long shower. <laughs> <laughs> it looked good though. I mean, ah, it looks fantastic. But you did not, you would never have known that it wasn't like a wet look gel or something like that. But uh, yeah, I felt for you that evening. The oldest trick in the book. I I was googling things about that and supposedly putting it over your face is really good for your skin as well. Right, keeps, keeps the moisture in or something. Mm-hmm. Right. I see. My, uh, whenever you, I use it for my lips, my girlfriend goes through me because it's got petroleum in it, which apparently dries them out more <laughs> long term. Whenever I use it for my lips, <laughs> such, such a sweet finger there. Did I, did I do something with my hands there? Yeah, you went like that with your but, finger. Oh well, I've been found out. Uh, so today, <laughs> 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 on that note, uh, we're joined by a hilarious stand-up comedian, uh, brilliant podcaster with Straight White Whale. It's one of the best, I think the best Scottish podcast that I know. Uh, never mind like British or whatever as well does that make sense I'm trying to be complimentary that sounded like I wasn't you know what I mean it's a great podcast uh, and he's also uh, Bobby and Scott Squad a hilarious character uh, one of my favourites um, but yeah welcome and thanks for thanks for coming down thank you very much for having us on that's a kind compliment as well it means a lot it's nice to be here yeah cool. I've really enjoyed listening to some of the older podcasts as well from the your your previous kind of channel Darren uh, Connell Show just, or something, right? Just Darren yeah. Connell, isn't it? When it was in a loft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My mate's loft. <laughs> so, so what was that? So you like sat next to the guest and there was just a camera in front of you, right? Yeah. yeah how did you find like chatting to someone but being next to them? It felt quite... Th- that entire thing just felt really strange. Right. Like to... I went to a school in Bishop Briggs called Turnbull High School and these two lads went to Bishop Briggs High. Okay. And I kind of knew them and they were just like... We're going to start a podcast in our loft, mate. Do you want to be the host? And I, it was just a bit mental. Yeah. How long ago was that? Oh, God, that was years ago. That must have been about seven years ago or something. Right. right. But yeah, I was getting like Greg Kempo and Jordan yeah. Young up and yep. stuff. And they were getting the neighbours in the street were coming to watch. Oh, you're so an, like an audience kind yeah. of thing. Oh, no way. That Uninvited, must, by the way. Uh, that must be a bit of pressure, though. Yeah. Just turning up with a bag of cans and sitting <laughs> in the corner and watching <laughs> Jordan Young. <coughs> like, Jordan Young's terrified. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but it was good fun. I mean, it certainly planted the seed for me to think that I could start it again and be more professional. Uh, but, yeah, that was that was good. That was crazy, though. What's, right. Sorry, what, what's changed since those that, that first foray into, like... Uh, How's it evolved for you? So now I'm in a professional studio and we're on like Spotify and we do all that type of stuff. Whether before it was just getting streamed on Facebook and there was nothing really professional about it. It was more of like for for from their side it was like it was a night to get pissed. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm a I'm trying to be a professional here. <laughs> <laughs> so we did a couple of live shows and they did really well and they sold out a few, but what, what's nice. the old saying, too many chefs boil the, bro- the mm. broth? Yeah. It was kind of that. Right, okay. People were booking guests without asking me and stuff and mm. it was just turning turn a bit mad. So, see, in terms of booking guests, like, that's something we were chatting about here, like, we tried to book guests or, I, I, like, I tried to book guests that I know, A, I'm interested in, B, like, I, I like, I like their stuff because I don't know if, if we had someone on that 
I wasn't or it was just like okay they're doing well in Scotland but it's not my thing I don't know if I'd be able to fake enthusiasm or fake like a chat do you know what I mean I don't know have, yeah. you, ever, have you had to do that many times without naming names with with the new podcast I don't book anyone that I don't know or uh-huh. that I'm not interested in right. and it's the same when I run gigs as well like I just try to I don't really book any bad people in my industry there's a lot of negativity and stuff so I'm like okay. obviously they need to be funny but I'm like if they're good natured good people which mm-hmm. is there, there's a lot of people in my industry that are like that then I'll book them and I think that's why the podcast goes is doing well mm-hmm. because I'm getting people on that get on with me and we like each other um whether before like those lads were trying to it was like a Jeremy Kyle approach like right. you know you were getting Scottish viral videos remember the girl that she was standing beside a grave some one of your family members were dead okay and she started singing my boy Lolly, lollipop so she had a skinhead and she was just rapping my boy mm, lollipop and it was like a family full of gangsters just standing beside her smoking cigarettes and she was like famous for a week right. campus got her in to sing the song and stuff <laughs> and then campus there was a warrant out for her, for her arrest <laughs> so she did her performance and then she walked Scarfing. off the stage straight into a police van <laughs> and my the producer guy was like get her own <laughs> <laughs> She can sing My Boy Lollipop. <laughs> I'm like, I but... And then what? Yeah. Is that, it's is just that, for the sake of some viewers at that point. Yeah. That's, that's then we're spiral then. Is that yeah. like Scotland's uh, Catch Me Outside, basically? <laughs> basically, aye. Damn. Yeah. Oh, that's an odd place to go. So, yeah, you keep it just people you want to be involved with. Yeah, pe- people that I find... F- there's no really... I try to keep it as organic as possible so there's no really rules to my podcast for the first 50 episodes it was just me and my producer paul and then i asked for some feedback and people were like we love the two of you but mm-hmm. it'd be nice if you got a guest in now and again opens up a so, little bit yeah so once every three weeks we'll get guests in i've had scott agnew yeah um, donna boyd from freed up she runs sober events right and i'm sober and that that subject means a lot to me so I got her on to talk about that, but she was talking about it from a female a female point of view. Like, you know, there's a lot of female homeless people and females with, like, alcoholism and stuff, and I didn't really know any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to get her on and get her to talk about that while also having a laugh as well. Yeah. Like, I think that's the difference. I'm, I'm never too serious. There's always a punchline at the mm-hmm. end. I, I liked it when you and Paul started opening up and stuff like that and like chatting more. It was a nice dynamic. Yeah. Um, we were chatting about that in the car here. So obviously we're very new into the the podcast podcasting, uh, like 15, 20 episodes, but you're sitting like over 100 in total. What, if you're stuck for something to say, or are you just talking about your week or how are you picking topics? Like what, how are you finding stuff to cover? You, yeah, you are pretty young in the, the podcast game. That's mm-hmm. why I feel pretty bad for charging you £1,000 for this. Did <laughs> uh, <laughs> I invoice the uni or the podcast? Like I'd go for the uni. <laughs> <laughs> this is our last episode. It's been a great run. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm just folding podcasts everywhere. <laughs> just everywhere you go. <laughs> Putting everybody out of business. Um, it's... I kind of, I mean, how the pod, my podcast started was uh, strange anyway. It wasn't deliberate. I stumbled, I mean, I could explain to you how it started. I'd be interested, yeah. 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 So it was during lockdown, um, during the pandemic, when uh, being self-employed, I'm sure you know yourself, your, your life just stopped. And for the first time since I was 18, I wasn't gigging. And I had no interest in making any, anyone laugh at that stage of life because it was pretty serious and then i was very lucky that my mate gave me a job as a window cleaner um his dad needed a knee replacement and i took his dad's place and just helped the family business and i think it was two years or two and a half years passed and i just thought i'm a window cleaner now and i just accepted it and then there was a young guy called Kieran Burns. Have you heard of him? I don't think so. He's got a podcast called All About Ability. Right. 
Um, I've known him my whole life and he was, he's got a disability and he's on a wheelchair, but his podcast is about how he lives with a disability and how he has an amazing life and mm-hmm. just to show people that if you've got a disability, you shouldn't be judged. So he wanted me to start a podcast with him and because it was the pandemic, he was having mental health problems as well. So I thought we were going to start it straight away and it turned into like me waiting for four months. Right. And I said to Paul Shields, my producer, I was like, Paul, I can't wait any longer, mate. I need to need to just keep working. And Kieran understood that as well. I'm still good friends with Kieran. And Paul was like, why don't you come in and do your own podcast? Never met Paul in my life. And I was just like, Paul, mate, I've been like living in my family's spare bedroom for two and a half years, no talking to anyone. I don't really know what to talk about. And he was like, well, talk about the last two years Mm. and I just put it down on a bit of paper and I went into the podcast studio and I treated it like a gig but at that point I was like no interest I'm like I'm not going to go back to this I was very unhealthy really stressed and as the podcast started to go on um Paul started to laugh at some things and it gave us the the bite back Mm-hmm. So then I was I started to say things more to make him laugh more. Yeah. And then the feedback was like, give your producer a mic. Mm-hmm. And then I found out that my producer, Paul, was a therapist. Mm-hmm. So it was essentially a week in the life of a stand-up comedian. Then the therapist was jumping in with his opinion and it just spiraled into this podcast and we found a voice. I started, I was looking back at earlier episodes, like I'm sitting there with my, my window cleaning stuff. <laughs> on <laughs> i had no hair because my hair fell out uh, and um yeah i just it's mad how life works out by the way it's absolutely mental how life works out and through doing that podcast it made me get a tour it made me sack my agent as well like a toxic agent just so much happened for me starting that podcast which i had no intention of starting it's just i need to pinch myself sometimes it's mad it's a really nice dynamic between the two of you having listened back to a few of them now and uh, there's you talking about things that are going on in your life and Paul's got these sort of little gems of insight into like why like why the mindset is what it is yeah um that's uh, that comes across really really nicely and it's, it's genuinely interesting to hear how his thoughts on things that are happening in your life or like reasons for why you're thinking certain things um from his perspective because he's got that that background and that sort of there's a validity to it all of a sudden which is uh yeah makes a, a really interesting listen yeah so paul runs the green room that's like a podcast studio is that right a podcast studio in glasgow right beside the mitchell library right and yeah he's a therapist and a podcast producer cool. and i class him as my po- my co-host Mm. and it's it's going well it's good fun keeps you accountable it keeps your brain sharp as well because if i never had that i'm the type of guy that just disappears and you wouldn't see me for six months and i reappear with a ginger beard and i'm 40 stone <laughs> saying that i was watching the golden girls <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's kind of kept me it's kept us very positive and it's nice there's, I, there's uh, nothing like having deadlines it's <laughs> like a something you've got to do <laughs> like to make it to make it happen yeah. um it's one of the things we've been talking about recently about progressing going forward with like episode, uh, season two of it and how to do it and fit it into our like fairly busy like business and normal work stuff yeah um but having being in here each week recording and then putting out every other week is like a very good uh necessity to have because otherwise if you just said we'll do it when we feel like doing it I'm, like it would just drift mm. and like yeah you need deadlines yeah how did um how often were you recording those podcasts at that time was it was it a weekly it started i think everything's got a teething process and definitely within the first 10 or maybe 15 episodes i, I didn't really know what was happening so and then you can get totally swallowed up by something as well. It has to be perfect. I, mm. I was writing it like it was a show. And then oh, you, right, okay. you realise that you keep it loose. So I, I kind of approached it a week in the life of a stand-up comedian with a 
therapist's opinion. Right. But never have it too serious. Always have a punchline. And, you know, ham it up a wee bit. Like, I, I would come away <coughs> with some mental opinions, knowing that <laughs> Paul would be like, you can't say that. But um, it just kind of grew from there. Um, How did that impact your mental health? Like, it's almost like sort of downloads for each week or every two weeks, like speaking to somebody for an hour or whatever the length of time it was. Do you find that a, a positive experience, being able to do that? I mean, there's a vulnerability to it, I would have thought, that... It's the first time I've heard you speak slightly bammy. Bammy? It was. What did I say? It was. Oh, no. Oh, it's rubbing <laughs> off on you. It's rubbing <laughs> off on you. You saying I'm a bam? <laughs> no, it's, we all are compared to your eloquent vocabulary, I think. I'll take that compliment. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, did, did you find that um, that altered your mindset towards the whole process, like having that back and forth with Paul? It definitely was strange to, because I was just living in a bubble for two and a bit year, mm-hmm. and I was even looking at old episodes. I was kind of sitting like that, almost like kind of cradling myself. Yeah, I don't know if it's a comfort thing. So it definitely was uncomfortable, but it was positive. If it wasn't positive, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep doing it. Mm-hmm. But going through that process I like it's actually not that hard and I think people build it up to be this impossible thing and then having the feedback from punters was just really nice as well I mean it's not it's a comedy podcast it's 100% comedy but it's so strange to be like I never thought I was going to gig again and then on one of the podcasts I was like I'm doing my first gig back in two and a half years and then the the tour happened and I feel like all that positive stuff happened through talking to Paul. Um, maybe not, because he he's like a working class guy that grew up in a scheme. The, the exact same as me. Mm-hmm. Anytime I talk to a therapist, I remember going to a therapist once and telling her that, I can find the funny side of this by the way. <laughs> I was like, I hear voices in my head when I try to sleep at night, I want to kill myself. And she was like, why don't you have a nice glass of warm milk? I was like, excuse me? I want fucking Valium. Um, <laughs> mix that in the milk. <laughs> uh, no, but it was like, it was always like, you know, I'm suicidal. I think I'm an alcoholic. And it's like, just take a deep breath. I was like, oh, no wonder people don't ask for help. Yeah. But then I'm talking to Paul and we're having a laugh about it. And I found, then I got therapist, uh, I got therapy f- from somewhere else. And then it just made me kind of, you know, even sack my agent was just a mass, massive thing that I never thought I would have done. Um, and now we're a fr- it's a friendship. Paul's not my therapist, by the way. I did, mm. I did ask him to be my therapist, but he was like, friendship, yeah. it can't mix. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's just turned into a friendship and obviously it's like a business as well, but it's just an amazing thing. What what kind of things made you sack your agent? Do you know, nothing against them, but I think a lot of, I mean, I'm not a trained actor, but a lot of actors and comedians, I I went with an agency that were one of the, the biggest in Britain. So if not the biggest, and, you know, Don French is on the books, Tom mm. Hardy. I don't have the same agent. I didn't have the same agent as Tom Hardy, but he was with that agency. So I always thought th- the gold was always just round the corner. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. get a wee bit of time, wee bit of time, wee bit of time. And that wee bit of time turned into six years. Right. And um, I was literally scraping bird shite off a window, working as a window cleaner. And getting fifty pound a shift. An agent get fiver. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I and I was like, why? Why am I like always trying to justify this to like somebody that's never getting me work? Mm. And I'm asking for like small things. Like I love Scottish horror. Could you maybe no put me in something like that? Mm. And she was like, What do you want to do that for? Like it was always mm. negative. You couldn't understand it from your perspective. Yeah. So in Panto as well, I loved Panto, and she's like, Why? Uh, and then during lockdown, I just was like, this is going nowhere. I can't do this. And that was a nice... It ended very well, professional, obviously. Yeah. But, 
Yeah, it got to the point that when she was phoning me, I was having panic attacks and stuff mm. before I even answered the phone. Yeah, that's not yours. Yeah, and she was putting me forward. I mean, I know my capabilities, right? I, I do believe in myself, but she was putting me forward for things that, you know, handsome, chiseled man in the lead of a detective drama. And I was like, I, I'm not that guy. I'm five down for that guy. <laughs> See the wee weirdo serial colour guy? I think I could play him. <laughs> the Vaseline in the sale. Yeah, the, 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 the guy Sorry, with the, guy the, with the glass mark of colour. <laughs> the glass of warm milk in the corner. Hi. Does anyone want a glass of milk? <laughs> uh, it's got more Valium in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she was getting me these additions for parts that were just so stressful. Right. That could, if I got that, it would change my life. Mm. But I was like, stop putting me forward for that and try and get me like a fucking Scottish gas advert or something. Like right. anything, man. Because there was no in between. Because I just want to be a, a working actor. So, yeah, that was nice to kind of end it. End it. it. How did your, if you don't mind talking about it, like your, how did your panic attacks, like, ma or like when did you realise that's what it was or how did they like manifest themselves? Oh, yeah. Did you, have you had panic attacks? I don't really know. I've had times where I, I'm all of a sudden just sweating uncontrollably. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. And then, like, obviously just mind racing. But not, like, I remember being in hospital once and someone was in the next room, like an A&E, and they were like, <gasps> like, couldn't breathe. And I was like, okay, that's a panic attack. So I've yeah. never considered anything I've had as a panic attack, but I know there's, like, different kinds. St stages, isn't there? Because yeah. I, I know, like, what you've seen with you, see someone who's physically shaking it. Yeah. I, um, not yeah. to name people, but it's... Uh, I know I've not had it to that level, but I can relate to what you're saying, but like dripping with sweat before some innocuous situation that for most people wouldn't even mm -hmm. affect them. Yeah. But for some reason, that thing, there must be a trigger point somewhere in it. Well, you should try a nice glass of warm milk. <laughs> 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 I just carry a microwave around with me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> also i said to a therapist once as well she was like what do you do when you're stressed and i was like i drink i was like what do you do she was like i take the horse out I was like, all right <laughs> you've got a horse um can i get a shot uh, <laughs> for me a panic attack feels like do you know the the basic the football pumps that pump it up yeah i feel like someone is attaching that to me and see when they pull it out I feel like the air just gets sucked, instantly sucked out of my body. Right. And I just can't breathe. So there's, I've not had one for a very long time, but I, w I became aware that, like, when my hair started to fall out and then I bloomed up to 22 stone and then there was other physical things that started to happen through that, I was like, this is really not going to end well mm -hmm. i've i've always experienced things like that but it was getting to the point that i couldn't function and i had a panic attack in front of my friend and i literally had to just drop to my knees and lie on the ground because I, I, I didn't really know what else to do mm -hmm. and my mate was like i've never in my life seen you like that before and uh yeah so i kind of i can feel it sometimes about to happen but it's never actually happened um because i know that you know you've got breathing exercises and just i love going for walks and stuff that really helps but mm. i haven't had one in a very long time maybe over i'd say about two years right okay yeah but i find the funny side of that i mean i don't know if did i tell you can i tell you a story about like a process that I went through when I thought I was dying. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, trust me. <laughs> I've got a mate called Seamus McCaffrey. He's the top sports scientist at Hamden. Cool. I see he's my mate. He was, we were mates in like primary school. Still and counts. I sent him a voice note 15 years later on Facebook, like, Seamus, can you help me? <laughs> and he's like, aye, you all right? Like, I need milk. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he works in the Hamden Sports Clinic and I couldn't get to the doctor during uh, lockdown. So I ballooned up to 22 stone and never had hair. And I had these two massive lumps on my neck, like round marble lumps on my neck. So obviously you think it's the worst case scenario when you find lumps. I was like, mate, I can't get to the doctors. 
can you give me a medical? And I went up to Hamden in lockdown where, like, you know, John McGinn and all that go. Mm. He had me running through the swimming pool with the mask on and stuff. Oh, yeah. Cool. On a treadmill. I was up there for hours, full Hamden medical, like a football player. And then at the end of it, he, he put this big mach- this big bit of paper, printed out this, like, cyborg machine. And he was just, like, looking at it. And he's like, ah, mate, you're just fat. <laughs> <laughs> but we've given you a position with Queen's Park. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's like, I, he's like I mean, you're fitter than half the cuts in here, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and the two years had this moment of just like laughing at the the, <laughs> the mad the madness of the situation. Yeah. I mean, he, he he said that as a joke, but he was like, "Look, you're absolutely riddled with stress. This is stress that's done this to you. The the swollen glands and stuff is stress." And then he's like, "You know, obviously through that stuff, like you're obviously probably abusing food and stuff." But he's like, "That's really, really common for stress to do this to your body, and this is probably why you're losing hair." So he's like, "There's nothing wrong with your heart or organs or anything like that, but stress is actually killing you. So if you don't do something about this, you're you're gonna have a heart attack." Because when I did get back into the hospital, I was going up to stop a hospital, and I was getting like heart scans and stuff. And the doctors was, were like, there's nothing wrong with you, apart from stress. Yeah. So, um, was that was that a relief to hear that? That there wasn't something more fundamentally wrong? I mean, it's still a difficult, it's not a, it's not something you just take a pill for and it goes away, you've got to put more effort in than that, but. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was, was it a relief to be told, well, you've got a diagnosis all of a sudden, it's something you can work on? Yeah. Well, I was trying to, like, I always found the humour of it because, like, when I bloomed up to 22 stone, I was like, I kind of hope it is my thyroids because I don't want to just be a fat bastard. <laughs> so when the doctor was like, it's not your thyroids, I was yeah. like, bastard. <laughs> 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 He's taking that away from me. <laughs> but it, it was a relief, but it also made me uh, very grateful because it made me aware of how dangerous stress is. Mm-hmm. Stress, stress is a horrible, horrible thing, by the way. And I don't know if people realise that. You don't think that people who haven't been through something very stressful, and I include myself in this because I don't think I've been through anything that stressful, Yeah. Um, can really appreciate what someone like yourself has gone through. Um, you know, losing hair, thyroid, well not thyroid, thyroid but glands swollen yeah. up and stuff like that. It's scary if you don't understand what's going on. Yeah. Cause you, you just assume there's something more intrinsically wrong with an organ somewhere and that's... The manifestation of all all that. Yeah. Fair play to you though, losing your hair and starting a podcast on camera to yes. and again, that's like major balls in the fact you're still wanting to find the humor in things and get out and make people laugh like this that's class, man. Yeah, I, I mean it doesn't feel deliberate. I feel like it's just happened and I stumbled into it and then doing therapies made me aware of things like, you know, there's when you start talking about things that you've never spoke about before mm-hmm. to people then you realise it's actually not that bad. And then you realise that other people go through it as well, yeah. just different levels. So see, see that journey with therapy? Because obviously like your first session, I don't know if you were the same, but your first session, you're kind of just stoic and you chat about things. It's maybe like two or three and then you have that break moment where you just start like blubbering and stuff. But what, like, was it just normal chatting therapy or was it like CBT stuff or? It was normal chari- uh, chatting stuff, but I've, I've done that as well. And... It was way back on side and it was over Zoom. Yeah. I've done therapy before and it's never really worked for me. But, you know, we what was the word that we were talking about? Like, remember when you say like things like when you're whistling a song and then it comes on the radio? Oh, uh, well, serendipitous. Yeah. So I don't know if that is this situation, but I remember when I was starting my, my tour and unfortunately I went in with a cowboy promoter that just made everything so much worse. So I was out walking one day on the debut. I was supposed to be doing Greenock that night and I never knew if I sold any tickets. I thought it was going to get cancelled and I was literally walking um, out in the street with my weighted vest on, 20 stone, 21 stone, literally talking to myself and my phone started ringing and it was Libby from Back On Side. Uh, Back On Side's a mental health charity 
and I've always kind of knew Libby, but she wasn't my pal, she wasn't my friend. And she phoned us and she was like, are you all right? And I was like, why? Why are you asking that? It's a bit odd. I've never had that conversation with her before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just told her the truth. Started like crying in the street. And then the therapist phoned us. And yeah, it just, it, that happened. What, what prompted her to phone the podcast? No, she was just like, I've asked her since then. And she was like, I've had a, I had a gut feeling about you. And she says she's had it with other people as well that she's phoned. So maybe... Or just a, like an instinct that she yeah. has to check in with somebody. Yeah. Right, okay. Oof. Yeah. So I thought that was really nice. I forgot the original question, actually. I've lost my place there, but... What kind of therapy did you do? Yeah, it was uh, Zoom. On Zoom for seven months, <coughs> and it was just kind of chatting therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. No, fair play to you. I'm glad you've... Uh, well, I don't know if you are. You have... Completely bounced back, but I'm glad you're, you're on no, the right track. No, here I've bounced back. It's made me learn a lot about myself. It's made me grow up a lot. And it's also, you know, yeah, it's been po it's been positive. I think people think it's a bit serious when we talk about all this stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I've always found the humour in everything in my life. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not, like, I think people get a wee bit, I don't know, is it nervous or like... I, I suppose don't know different people are diff have different reactions to it. I mean, for, for a lot of people, it's a... It's a cliche, but it's a difficult thing to talk about because yeah. there is a stigma. But and I'm I probably have that would have that same stigma for myself, not wanting to talk about it openly because people would look at you as being weak or something along yeah. those lines. But of all the people I've ever talked to about these things, I've never once come away thinking that any less of that person. Yeah. And I actually probably think a damn sight more of them because they have the strength to talk about it. So I think it's, uh, we've not really delved into this too much within this podcast so far, but I think there's a, a lot of utility in it for, hopefully, people who are watching, and if for nobody else, for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, do you yeah. Remember, man. Do you remember any funny moments during the therapy? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it was kind of like the podcast, you know, just yeah. rambling, that that bus driver looked at me funny. I'm right. going to kill him. Like, you can't eat, just kill <laughs> random bus drivers. <laughs> like, how no? <laughs> or, you know, you know, daft things like my cousin called me Specky 17 years ago and I've no spoke to him since. <laughs> Maybe you should phone your cousin, mate. It's a bit much. <laughs> but I, I mean, I can't remember specifically, but I do remember laughing during it. Yeah. It can be a positive thing. It's intense as well. Yeah. Um... You know, it is like an, you get emotional hangovers and stuff, but it, it kind of remi reminds me of... Get, have you ever had, like, a really intense massage where the next day you'll feel unwell? No. Like I, I get that quite a lot. If, if you're stressed and you're tensed up, right. so if you get a massage, it releases all the toxins and stuff, mm, and yeah. it makes you feel like you've got the flu the next day. Right. But it's overall positive for you. Yeah. And that's what I felt like when I was doing therapy either after it or the day after it, I felt really rough. But looking back now, I'm like, I had to do that. Yeah, that was it's good. just part of the process of going through that. Yeah. What would you, not to be wanky, if you could talk to, like, you back then, would you say anything or give them any advice for someone listening that's in that kind of situation? Class of milk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not letting that go. Uh, or buy a horse. Uh, <laughs> Same you skimmed or a hole? <laughs> horse milk. Horse milk. Uh, <laughs> it's weird because it's like, see, when you're trapped in that situation, you can't really think straight. So see, looking back now, I'm like, why did I not see this? Yeah. But see, when you're stressed or depression and stuff, you just, it's like you're walking about with a wee fog in your brain. So if I did give myself any advice, I would just, I know it is cheesy. I'd just be like, it gets better. Yeah. Just hold in, strap mm. the seatbelt in, and it'll get it'll get better. They should put that in a motivational poster. Strap yeah. the seatbelt in and all that. <laughs> 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 Hashtag seatbelts. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, on a similar kind of theme to that in your comedy, you weren't writing or performing comedy during that point in your life, were you then, the sounds of it? When you got out of that, did, did you carry some of those, was there any lessons you carried away from it in terms of what kind of mindset you need to be in or what needs to be happening in your life or in your day-to-day -day stuff to 
put you in your best place to write comedy or to perform comedy? It's like well, I, I would say that going through that gave me an unbelievable gratitude for comedy, something that I started to maybe take advantage of or I was just taken for granted. Mm -hmm. I not advantage, taken for granted. And... I mean, even my very first gig back was the 3rd of January. It was at the stands at Red Raw to a sold-out Red Raw crowd, and it was 220 people. And, you know, I was walking about with a mask for two years, not talking to anyone. And even then, I was like, oh, I'll just go in and wing it because I've done a million Red Raws. I'll, I'll go up and I'll do, like, proper golden oldies that I know that will get laughs. Mm. And then I walked out in front of a crowd, and I genuinely forgot my name. Like, right. I was so nervous. I forgot my, some jokes that I've I've had in the bank for 10 years. I was forgetting it. And I was like, wow, this is like a muscle memory that I never knew that you would have. Mm -hmm. Because I, I never stopped before. Yeah. So it made me just approach it differently. And to get a fresh kind of joke pad and just start over again was like really nice i don't think you lose it you don't lose the ability to to process a joke or to create a punchline but um it definitely made me realize like i've been a bit of a selfish bastard i'm getting i was bitter jealous not appreciating what i was getting um and also like See, to get in front of a crowd and make a bunch, like, a hundred people laugh, mm -hmm. that is unbelievable. Like, see, when I've heard people say, if I'd done ten gigs and I smashed one gig, I'd, I'd remember that for the rest of my life. So sometimes I was going up and I was, like, doing amazing in front of 400 people, and I was walking off and thinking, so fuck, like, yeah. yeah. And I'm so glad that I feel like I get stripped down to my bare bones and started over again, and, uh, yeah, I'm glad. Is that a big thing in comedy then? Because I know <clears throat> you see some people kind of go, obviously, like you say, 400 people laughing and they're all like, they've all dedicated their attention to you and the ego can just go absolutely wild. Is that quite common? Even, say, like in Scottish comedy, I'm not talking about like the, the greats, but... Yeah, it can happen. I think it's human nature as well. Um, it can happen, like people getting too big for their boots mm -hmm. and stuff and getting a bit, you know, diva-like. But f from what I've learned through experience is that these people don't last that long. Mm -hmm. Their their ego becomes so toxic, they'll, they'll say something to the wrong person, mm -hmm. like an agent or a TV producer. And, you know, these people always get found out in the end. Mm -hmm. I was never a bad person to comedians. I was always a bad person to myself. Um, I'm grateful for that. Uh, but, yeah, these people don't last for long. And you saying you started at 18, that's like quite a slog in comedy. That's such a young age to get on stage and start trying to make folk laugh. Like what What was like the catalyst to actually say, oh, fuck, I'm going to do this? Uh, well, my very first gig was at the stand in Red Raw. Right. In Glasgow. And, do you know, I don't even know. I've, I've always loved comedy, right? I've mm -hmm. always loved m movies. I've had this obsession with movies since a young age very grateful that my granddad got me into that and you know most of my childhood and early adult life I just remember being tuned to a tv and just consuming movies mm -hmm. and like I, I always found that I was the type of person that was trying to make my mates laugh and stuff so it wasn't like abnormal to to me to go towards that yeah but I was so unaware of the industry I had no, no knowledge of it I didn't know what comedy clubs were didn't even know what the word compare meant and uh i was studying tv production and sound recording right and i was i was being a class clown in the class mm. and a guy in the class was like mate you should try stand-up comedy and i was so naive i was like where i never even knew you could <laughs> nice. get, i never knew you could get stand-up comedy clubs mm -hmm. in scotland i thought there was eddie murphy yeah billy conley Outside of that, I was like, I never knew you could get stand-up comedians. Right, okay. And uh, he told me about the stand and, you know, see when you're young, nobody tells you anything. Nobody tells you, yeah. you need to write five minutes, you need to have a punch. I never knew what any of that stuff meant. And I went up 
and I made the ultimate sins of everything that you shouldn't do, I done. Um, took all my mates. Mm-hmm. I got paralytic drunk. <laughs> I wore a stupid suit for some reason. <laughs> and well, I didn't Eddie Murphy and Billy Conley, like you can see where that comes from. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't wear uh, I didn't uh, write any jokes really. Right. So, so what was your material sounding like then? Was it Thankfully, I can't really remember. <laughs> <laughs> but Just suppressed it all. I, I said a joke and I got a laugh and I was so drunk, I repeated it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, you think it'd be better the second time round? <laughs> well, the audience were like laughing at the start and then when the, it came again, they were like, oh, this guy's not, that's not a joke. Mm. So it went like really weirdly silent. Uh, okay. So Slight, horri- Slightly worried or just knowing you were drunk? Drunk, first time. Horrifically died on Mars. It was so embarrassing. Everything about it was so embarrassing. Like in front of my, all my mates, like just so drunk. And like later on in my life, I think I was maybe twenty four. I, w- I was I started to look back on that, and I thought I cannot have that as my first and last time. So you you had that six gap, the six year gap mm. in there then. Yep. So what inspired? So then it was just a case of I don't want that to be the my memory of like stand up for me. I was so haunted by it because I, I I had some awareness of thinking I know I'm not that bad, uh-huh. and that was bad. bad. That's as bad. Like even me doing it for like fifteen years, I've never seen a performance that bad <laughs> as somebody doing it the first time. And um, I was in the I, I went and did the barber college for a year. I was learning right. how to be a barber and. I was just walking about the college, again, dogging class and not interested. And I seen a poster on the wall and it said Charlie Rossi's comedy course. And 10 week course, learn how to do stand up. And I thought, I'm going to sign up to that. And I'm so glad that I did because I went into this guy's course and nobody can ever teach you how to be funny. Mm-hmm. That You can't be taught that. But he taught me about green rooms, uh, what words meant, like headliner, closer open spot right so i kind of learned all that stuff and then during his course i started to do some gigs again and yeah it changed from there it changed from there when i did my second gig again i thought if i'm shite i'll never do it again and i'll feel all right about that but then i got a couple of laughs and i thought if i just keep working at this i think i'll i'll get something i know that if i just keep working at it it's so strange to be because I never even knew, like, where does your hand go when you hold a mic and stuff? Like, just all that type of stuff that goes yeah. through your head when you're nervous. Just really basic. Like, it's when you're, some, you're aware that you're walking somewhere and people are watching you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or uh, when there's a bus going, you're trying not to walk in time to the music. <laughs> oh, ever that? <laughs> <laughs> and then you end up in the offbeat, like, fuck. Yeah. Um. So you're talking about, I like, we things you get taught. Because I see it on Kill Tony, some of the feedback they give often is to, like, grab the mic stand put it behind you then you start but now everyone does it in like the same way and i'm like oh that it kind of takes me out of it i'm like oh they're just doing the thing yeah it's a weird one yeah you see that as well it's like you'll get some amazing joke writers that are not funny people yeah so they'll go on to the stage and they'll say a joke and then they'll have their pint glass and when they say their joke they'll do that because <laughs> they're waiting for an applause they're break. waiting for the laugh yeah ah. so it's like you can see their eyes being like, uh, wait for applause break. Yeah. Whether a, a true stand-up comedian, I think they just, what makes me, f- what makes me laugh, and if you don't laugh at it, then we continue to the next gig. Mm. Mm-hmm. Applause break. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that fella milk? <laughs> <laughs> wait till the volume hits. <laughs> oh, you'll need more than that for me. <laughs> yeah, so there's a big difference between being able to write funny material and then deliver it or perform it yeah what and then so what's the difference between writing or performing stand-up comedy and then starring a comedy show because squat squad you i think you were saying a lot of it is uh off the cuff you're given a a scenario and you've got to work to that or can you tell us about the audition for that as well just for yeah 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 Yeah. i tell you about the audition first yeah Yeah, just because i thought it was an interesting format so that's another thing that I look back on and I'm like, thank God I said yes to that 
Like there's so there's such a run of events throughout my entire life with everything with so many things. I'm just like if I said no to that, that wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. So there there used to be a pub up from the Stand Comedy Club called the Holt Bar. So see, back in the day, it was two pounds for a ticket for Red Raw. Okay. And it sold out every single week. Two hundred and twenty people every single week. Sometimes you had Frankie Boyle, mm -hmm. Kevin Bridges, Gary Tank Commander doing stuff. It was unbelievable right and it, it still is but back then it had an energy and it used to sell out people used to get sent away from the door mm -hmm. so the halt bar started this night up the road from it so not it was a free comedy night so not only were people just going anyway you had to stand knockbacks going mm -hmm. so this gig turned to an amazing gig as well and i was like still early in the game so the guy that was running the whole bar was like, do you want to do 10 minutes tonight? And at that point, I was gigging all the time, like seven days a week. And I was shattered that night, absolutely exhausted, couldn't be bothered. And I was getting a wee bit bored of my material. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to go and just riff 10 minutes because it's that night, it's that type of night Mm -hmm. That if it doesn't matter if you smash it, it doesn't matter if you horrifically die in your arse, that's what the night's for. Right. So I was like, if, if I horrifically die in my arse, it's not going to change my life, it's not going to affect my career, yeah. but it might benefit me somehow. So I went down with some kind of subjects and I started to improvise and I'd done really well. And then after it, um, Joe Hullett came up to us, he was in the crowd having a couple of beers. And Joe is the creator of Scott Squad. Mm -hmm. And I knew him at that point. But he was like, the comedy unit are holding auditions on Friday for this show, if you want to come in. And he didn't make it sound good at all. He was just off the cuff. And I was like, mate, I'm working on Friday. What's an audition? And he's like, just come in. And at first, I was like, I can't be... In my, in my head, I was like, I can't be bothered. He's not really selling this well. And then they got in touch and they were like, look, we're, we're making a show and we can't tell you what it's called, but you can either be a police officer or a BAM. So if you create your own character for five minutes and come in and it's an addition. So I went into the comedy unit and Noddy was there, the director. He does like the Lemay show and chewing chewing the fat and stuff cool. and joe was there as well <coughs> and for five minutes i just riffed this character and it was a bam and nobody was laughing joe was laughing and i was like i was that was good fun and then i got an email saying you've got a second part you've got another edition but it's a group edition and it's going to be improv games so we went into this big theater and I walked into this room and there was like 30 actors there and some of them were like proper cradling themselves, like shaking with nerves. Oh, really? And I was working in Asda that day. I had to get changed in the toilet in the, in the venue uh -huh. from my uniform to my normal clothes. And I, wa I went into this room and I think it was just a lot of things. I was like, I'm not going to let this like i would rather be shite mm -hmm. than ruin it with being nervous mm. so i was like i'm going to treat this like a gig i don't care who is in this room and we were just doing quick fire improv games and you know there were some people there that are in the show like officer karen was there grado's colleague manny he was there yeah uh, a couple of river city people and i started to get laughs and it was really addictive and it was great fun and four months passed and then they told us that I was going to be in it oh you quite a big gap in yeah yeah four months of silence nothing and what were you doing in between like in that time frame were you were you still thinking that it was a possibility that this would come online or were you just sort of put it to the back of your head and for, forgotten about it for the first month i couldn't stop thinking about it right. and then after that i was just like is this something that i just need to let go yeah. mm -hmm. and then by that point i just kept gigging i was working as a trolley boy in asda and then 
they got back in touch with us and were like they were like we're making this show but I think the reason why it took so I've been told this the reason why it took so long for them to get me into it was because my my addition was so silly and surreal they thought he can't be a police officer because it's going to be stupid so Joe then was Joe suggested like why don't we make him as a pest or a nuisance? So they were sort of had to rewrite for a character to, to make you fit into yeah. it, but they wanted you to have that energy there. Yeah. That's cool. And I also had to tone him down a wee bit as well. Right. So see, when I play Bobby, like sometimes, like even though Bobby's a very silly, stupid character, mm-hmm. I'm doing it deadpan. Yeah. But that's because they're standing behind the character, like bring it down a wee bit. Because when I first started doing it, I was proper like a human cartoon mm. <laughs> so uh they were like yeah that's too silly or it's too unrealistic right and then we brainstormed it together and we, ca- we came up with the character together like bobby i've said this so many times like but there was a comedian called gus limburn that used to call me bobby dazzler and i always found it really funny and i thought keep bobby right and then muir was a scottish comedian called jim muir that plays a character called the Reverend Obadiah Steppenwolf. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was like, use Muir as a tip of the hat to one of my favourite stand-ups. Mm-hmm. And then I just started using things in my own life, like Fridge. Fridge was the dog. Mm. And when I was younger, I used to get called Fridge after an American football player. Right. My, my brother's boss used to call me it. So there's lots of elements of you woven into the, yeah. the whole narrative then. That's yeah. quite cool, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. F- I didn't hear anything about it. I didn't hear anything. I'm not talking shit, am I? No, 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 no it's, it's good. good. Uh, I need to restart the Egyptian after an hour. Is that still recording? Still recording yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, we had a guy called Fridge at my school as well, but <laughs> folks said it's because a, f- a fridge fell on his head when he was a baby. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Poor guy. <laughs> but saying that, I say he's a poor guy. I have a bone of contention with him, so I was on a date. It was like a second date with this girl when we were at the cinema. And he was he was just kind of one of these guys that's just a wee bit of an oddball. Um, I didn't know, like, what was, like, medically wrong or anything like that. Nice guy. Everyone was nice to him. Um, but he was ahead of me in the queue for the cinema to go see Ted, and I was on this date. So I was like, oh, there. I came over. I was like, oh, that's how you doing? Not, not seeing you in a while, not seeing you since school. How you doing? Oh, yeah, good, good. This is my third time seeing Ted. I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, he's like, I'm just coming with my dad. I'm like, all right. So oh, this is... Oh shit! I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Beat that. <laughs> we'll bleep it. Hi. Uh, this, we'll bleep is, it. Uh, this is this uh, is Ashley Horace. Uh, like nice to meet you, blah blah blah. So he went over to his dad's, and I was like, "Oh yeah, he's at school, just explaining the situation." And he comes back. Oh, I've just said to my dad, "I can, I, I'll just sit with you guys." Uh, and I was uh, like, "Oh, I, was like, I don't leave your dad." Oh fuck! I can see the names, man. <laughs> <laughs> right, please bleep that out because we'll, that's we'll, shady. No, no, we will bleep them. Um, and I, I was like, uh, I was like, oh, don't leave your dad, man. That's shit. He's like, no, it's fine. My dad says it's cool. I'm like, yeah, fuck, I bet he did. So we went in and we're like buying sweets and everything like that. And I was like, are, are you sure? So you're going to sit with us? Like, that's okay with your dad? And he's like, yeah. So it was, um, yeah, me, the girl, and then, then there. And I had like a bag of sweets. And uh, he's, like, he's like, oh, do you mind if I take one? <laughs> Licked his hand and just put his hand in my bag of sweets. So I was just sitting there for like this. It's like, what did I even do that? So I just offered... Take a few. So <laughs> take the top layer off. Woo. I get my clean suits. <laughs> but, oh my god, it's just patching his dad. Like it was a strange situation, very uncomfortable. But was he in between the two years? No, no, no. <laughs> Imagine that would have been hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, big fridge. So yeah. he was. Uh, he was called fridge then. Yeah. Right. He probably cut that whole story and just start again now. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <Old fridge. laughs> I've looped the names, but yeah, that's thing, and that's quite funny. Yeah. Um, I so I liked what you said earlier, but I didn't want this uh, to be my lasting like memory of doing stand up. So obviously, comedy meant a lot to you yeah. growing up, and you're like, I want to contribute in some way. That's not going to be my mark on comedy. Uh, but it was your granddad that got you into it. Yes. So, so what what kind of stuff was he feeding you comedy wise? Do you know he, he passed away when I was quite young, but he definitely altered my my mind with it he was he was such an interesting character 
Anytime I used to go into his bedroom, he just had posters of like Marx Brothers, mm-hmm. Laurel and Hardy, Buster Keaton. Mm-hmm. Um, supposedly, I do remember him being funny, but my mum told us that he was very funny, like really good at doing accents. And right. Used to carry props about with him and stuff, like trick props and mm-hmm. used to do card tricks and stuff. And um, I just remember like sitting watching Marx Brothers stuff with him. Mm-hmm. Even at a young age of being like five, six and seven. And I couldn't understand some stuff. But, you know, there was a character called Harpo that he didn't speak and he played the harp. So Gr- there was Groucho Marx, Marx, who's quite intelligent. He was for the older people. Mm-hmm. Chico Marx played the piano and he was like flirty with the females and then Harpo was like child friendly. Okay. So when I was a child, I was like, Harpo Marx is unbelievable. And then he played the harp and watching Chico play the piano was just unbelievable. And so I just remember having these amazing memories of like, watching all these old black and white Laurel and Hardy movies mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And later on in life, I think I might have been about 18, I was clearing the loft out and I found a VHS tape of a Marx Brothers movie called Go West. Okay. And I just, I, when I was studying a course in college and I started to dog college, I remember I used to just watch that every day. Mm-hmm. Watched it like a hundred times. So he definitely, I, f- I look back at that and I'm like, even when I wore the suit, see the, the suit that I wore at my first gig? Yeah. That's because he used to wear wear weird stuff. What kind like, of suit? I just went into a charity shop and bought like this three piece suit, like three different parts to three different suits. <laughs> okay, and it was like yeah. really big and <clears throat> I was wearing a top hat and stuff. But yeah. I feel like he, he used to do stuff like that. Okay. And uh, he definitely like... He, he definitely started it, but my mum's really funny as well. Like yeah. when I was young, she used to, I used to watch like planes, trains and automobiles with her and mm-hmm. like that type of movies. But yeah, I remember, I remember him being very, very funny. Very funny. That's cool. All my mum's side are very funny. My mum's fucking hilarious. I'm sure she wouldn't mind me saying this, but she, in fact, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We can always cut out if you decide it's after the fact. Yeah, so recently she was like, I'm getting a new pair of false teeth. And I was like, when's the last time you had a pair of false teeth? She's like, oh, back when you were born. I was like, what? I'm like, you telling me the last time you got a set of false teeth was 1987? <laughs> and I'm 34 years old. And she's like, hi, I've had the same pair. I was like, that doesn't sound right. You're you're supposed to get a new pair of fucking false teeth like every four year. Oh, right. And she that. had the same pair <laughs> since nineteen eighty seven. So sustainable. But it was like I noticed things like see when she was talking and stuff, they used to like fall out her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, they don't even fit you anymore. <laughs> I suppose you probably your, your mouth changes and your head shape changes <laughs> over time over so, 34 years. You're up like, my mum's hilarious. She's always just knocking her teeth out for a laugh. Using the props. Like, they're just ancient. So she says she went to the dentist and the dentist was totally like, could never, he didn't believe oh, her at shit. first. He's like, no. there's no chance you've had them since 1987. Yeah. So, aye, that's my family. <laughs> Seems like the kind of thing you'd maybe get told while you're getting them in yeah. or just after and then just like, if you don't write it down, Four years is a long time to remember something like. Yeah. Damn. Okay. Yeah. So well, now I mean, she's cutting about with like turkey teeth. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's class. So um, going back to like the kind of improv stuff, was that for Scott Squad? Do you ever had any experience of improv prior to to that uh, to the edition, uh, the second edition where you were part of the group? No, and uh, that was my very first, Scott Squad was my first edition, and I never did a lot of improv until then, w- which is quite weird because, like, I remember even when I was doing Scott Squad, I was supposed to be doing a Glasgow Comedy Festival show, and I was I said to Raymond Mearns, yeah. very, very funny He's comedian, by the yeah. way, 
one of my heroes and he pulled us aside and he's like yeah see you you're just fucking funny mate like oh cool just relax breathe find a subject that you think's funny and just run with it so he just like a light switch just clicked when he told me that i was like well he's the master mm. and he's telling me that so since that he told me that i just kind of applied that to everything i was doing um with the improv stuff with scott squad we were quite lucky because when we do a scene that's free takes so right. that's a bit of breathing space i feel it takes the pressure off the first take yeah but it, w- it was never really hard for me um i think my mind is just different like I feel more relaxed doing improv than I do reading a script. Because mm-hmm. yeah. it's like silly and it's not... Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you have bad takes and make mistakes and stuff, mm-hmm. but I feel like when you're trying to make something, you're just in the zone of, like, this has to be good. And yeah. Then doing hundreds and hundreds of gigs, you, you become aware of... It's like when a comedian writes a joke and they're like, oh, I don't know if this is this is funny until I do it in front of a crowd. Yeah. I think you should know if it's funny. You should have a sense. Yeah. yeah. Like there's something in that, like even a word, like you can make it better. Um, Yeah. And then you'll just learn through constantly doing it. So when you're saying you brought elements of your life into Scott Squad um, and it's mainly improv, so like, what, what's the balance of, like, they give you a situation, you're going to come in and, I don't know, like, you've lost your dog or something like that, and then they just say, just say what you want, basically. Or or how much was it, like, framed, and how much did you get a say in, I want this to be the situation? So the they were very, very professional with me. It was really good. Yeah. Joe, who is a genius, fantastic guy. His comedy mind is just, he seems, sees things differently. So he would they'd give you like a wee sheet of paper, like that size, mm-hmm. and on the sheet of paper it would say, Bobby runs into the station with a bag of donuts that are out of date, and then i just go off that. Mm-hmm. But because <laughs> we were such a small team, and I, I like to think that I've not got an ego, so I was like, if this is shite, just tell me it's shite. Yeah. And if you want to feed me lines, like feel free to feed me lines. And we were, I was saying that to cameramen and stuff, like, mm-hmm. feed me a line if you think it's good. Cool. Or suggest something and I'll try and alter it. So, and then between the three takes, um, we would try and figure it out. So, sorry, what was it? Aye, aye, aye. Um, so, it, we would get, like, 20 scenes, 20 costume changes, but it would always be, like, such a small thing, like, Bobby runs into the station and falls. Mm. Or that was a great one. Yeah. I love that one. <laughs> and it, we, we literally talk, before we start filming, Noddy gets the call sheet out and he's like, right, so you and Karen will be standing here. You'll fall down. What do you think will happen? Okay. And, and then we'll, like, we'll be like, why don't we try this or say this or say that? And yeah. Jen Gen- gets harder for like saying a scene like that when you're coming in and just face planting is a hilarious take. Like, is it harder for you? Or for Karen to just act that straight face and concerned. <laughs> Who's got the tougher gig? I think it's about... I think we're kind of both like our characters. Right, okay. In real life. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of like Bobby and she's <laughs> like Officer Karen. Okay, so yeah. she's like a, a, a mother figure. An a angry mother figure. Um, I think it? it's really hard to be a straight man in a yeah. comedy duo as well. Chris Forbes is good at it. Yeah. And uh, that Mikkelsen, if that's improv, he's phenomenal. Oh, it's all all improv. That's mm. crazy, man. All he's he's improv. super super talented. Man. But it's it, <coughs> it is hard. It's it's hard for the. It's, it makes a good team though. Like when it works well. Yeah. Um, how much of the what you're gonna do do you discuss with the people you're working with, or like that the actors you're working with prior to jumping into a scene? Do they do you talk about some of the lines you might say or like? Or is it very much? It's very, it's very organic, for want of a better term. Like what we see on the television, like your person you're working with doesn't know what you're going to say before you say it. It's yeah, it's totally organic. Right. So by the third take, we'll figure it out. So yeah. the first take, there might be a mistake, and I'll be like, "Sorry, I spoke over you there, Karen." Right. And then we do it again. 
And then she's like, all right, I see what we're trying to do. And then the fuck take, it it works. But it is very organic. I mean, sometimes I've watched it back. There there was a scene where I'm wearing unisex glasses (laughs) about, and I break them because I climb up scaffolding and I stumble my words and I say scarefolding and I didn't mean it. And they kept it in. Right. <laughs> and I was like, no way, that's a blooper. They've kept a blooper in there. Oh, that's cool. And um, there's pe- pe- people that are saying like, oh, we seen you there and you nearly laughed. I'm a mad giggler. Like Karen's a professional trained actress. So right. I'd always be laughing or giggling or, you know, but she was she was the pro. I don't think she laughed much. And I was always laughing at myself or if the, the cameraman was laughing or something, I, w- I would start laughing. Yeah. But it was always kind of me that was making the mistakes. Everyone laughing because you're laughing. Yeah. Did you take that as a challenge to try and make Karen break? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah, it was good fun. And then Phoebe came in as well, a new actress called Officer Sharon. And she was fantastic. She was brilliant. Is that the late? I don't think I ever got to that. I think I was maybe like four seasons in or something and just... yeah. Yeah, she was Officer Sharon and Officer Karen. So, um, yeah, she was fantastic. We had great fun. It was good fun. That's cool. And see, when you said uh, that Bobby would be a pest, I've got a, a viewer question. And uh, he's if it keeps going, he's becoming a bit of a pest. It's a guy called <laughs> Mikey, Mikey Motion. So oh, right, okay. in, in one of our episodes before, he, he asked Mark Black if he would date him. Uh, so that was a no. But he's getting back on the horse, so he wants to say to you, I love you to the moon and back, baby. Would you date me? <laughs> <laughs> I always say that to people. Um, <laughs> I, I say to them that I love I love them to the moon and back. I'm okay. not too sure where I heard that. I think I heard it on a movie. And I always say it to people. <laughs> so that was a wee in-joke there right, between okay. me and Mick. But would I date him? Uh-huh. Aye. I'm, I'm not getting anything, so. There you go, Mikey. I'd pump him. <laughs> <laughs> That's your Saturday sorted out. <laughs> Mark let him down quite savagely, saying because he's from Camus yeah. and he just wasn't considering it. <laughs> oh, no. I should have said something like that. <laughs> no, no, I've yes never pumped a DJ before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, on you go, sorry. I was just going to ask, so when you're performing stand-up, or acting how much do you, do you enjoy it at the time or is it something like do you have enough headspace to enjoy it at the time or is it it's an after the fact once you've sort of been able to have a wee bit of distance from it uh distance from it and well just just in terms of being able to sort of stand back from it and appreciate maybe the moments you were having at the time or or can you enjoy it at the time when you're you're acting with somebody um with scott squad and stand up Yes. Um, In that order. I think... I think... I don't know what it is, but... I don't know if it's a Scottish thing. I don't know if it's just a human nature thing. But... I do look back at Scott Squad and I'm like, I wish I enjoyed that more. Right. It's not that I didn't enjoy it. And Uh it's not that I didn't give 100%. I absolutely did. But... For someone to try and be an actor or a comedian, someone could live their whole life and not get a TV show. And I was in that TV show for 10 years Mm. as one of the main characters. I just wish I was in the moment a lot more. Um, But I don't regret performance-wise or anything like that. I did think I gave it my all. But looking back now, it's quite sad that it's over. Do you feel like that happened now you would appreciate it in the moment more yeah absolutely is it like therapy and stuff that made you reminisce or? yeah and also like just getting a wee bit older and realizing that you have got one life and like you know to do something like that is so unique yeah mm-hmm. so unique and i was like surrounded with a lot of negativity as well people were like oh, i don't really watch it it's kind of shite and stuff i used to get i used to hear a lot of that stuff a lot of trolls online but we were the second apart from still game uh we were the second biggest show in scotland yeah. for years like even when we first came out we were up against i can't name the guy because he's a, a beast 
Uh, but and in fact, I won't say his name. <laughs> uh, but he had a UK wide show, and we were only in Scotland, and we had more views than this guy. Right. So and it was constant, and we then we won a BAFTA, and then I get put up for a new talent BAFTA award as well, and I never won it. But the fact that I was even there was just yeah. mental. So yeah, I would definitely I would enjoy it a lot more. Things like turning up to like rap parties, I stopped doing all that stuff, and I'm like, right. oh, I wish I did that more and mm. cast the dinners and and all that. Why did Why didn't you participate as much in those? I think I just started to enjoy my own company. It was It was nothing like nothing negative. Against them. Yeah, nothing, nothing against them, or just being like, oh, I can't be arsed. And mm-hmm. then you don't, then you start to realize like that's not a normal occurrence. Like I should have been there and enjoyed myself. Even with stand up now as well, like. I used to let it, if I had a gig in a week, I'd let that consume my mind. I'm so nervous. I, ho- I hope I don't die in Mars mm. to the point that it would make me unwell. Yeah. So now I'm like, never ever get like that with stand up comedy. It's fun. People have been working all day. They're there to be entertained. Try your best. Yep. As long as you try <coughs> your best, that's all that matters. So I, I do get nervous before work and before gigs, but it's like, if I'm gigging on a Sunday, I'll get nervous on the Saturday. But it's a, it's a good nerves now. And plus, I've done it so much in Scotland that I know that if I just try my best, it'll, it will be a good night. So I do enjoy the moment. It's weird being on stage doing stand-up because I get really nervous before it. And then when I'm on stage, I feel like I'm in a warm bath or something. It's kind of calm comes over. Yeah. yeah. And then after it, I'm just adren- adrenaline's through the roof. But you get used to it after a while. Uh-huh. Yeah. See, when you were talking about online trolls and stuff like that, um, I th- I'm sure I heard you say recently or something on TikTok. You've turned the tables and you now enjoy being a troll, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How's that going? I enjoy being trolled. Oh, being I don't trolled. En- I okay. don't enjoy get being a troll. I've never been a troll. Okay, right. I also enjoy l- responding to them. Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So there's a thing on TikTok you can do where you click reply and you can reply through a video response, uh-huh. and I I do get a thrill from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. That took a long time. Like when you're young and you work in Asda and I was on Vine, remember? Remember Vine? Oh, I no. love Vine, yeah. I used to get death threats on Vine really? when I was a trolley boy and it was horrific. Jesus Christ. This was years before therapy and before there was online, you know there's online laws now that you can't troll people? Yeah. There was none of that back in the day. Yeah, it was just People wild. said they were going to kill me and attack me in the street. What for? Do you know, there was a wee community of Scottish Vine people that just didn't like me, and I don't know why. And it turned into this thing where, you know, a little rumour started. Someone said that, I think it was like, he thinks he's better than everybody. Mm. And it just turned into this monster. So, and then, you know, fake accounts started trolling me, and... It was pretty brutal, man. It was, like, really brutal. I was to the point that I was worried about, like, walking in Glasgow City Centre and stuff. Nothing ever happened. I think, see, when you know that you've done nothing wrong, the truth always comes out. Yeah. So, recently, I actually had one of the guys get in touch with me about two years ago, and he apologised. Oof. And I found that really powerful. He's like... He said something along the lines of, I don't even know what that was all about, but yeah. I got caught up in the madness of it. And I'm really sorry. And I accepted his apology. And then there's a couple other guys that have kind of said sorry, but it was just one of those things that just, I don't even know. There was a big massive Facebook group and this guy added me to it and I didn't want to be in it. So I just left. Then he tried to add me again and I left again. And it just started because of that. Mm. Right, okay. And then I was trying to explain to them, like, just because I'm not following you or not talking to you doesn't mean that I dislike you. Yeah. Like, I'm entitled to not follow you, mate. Like, don't take that as an insult. And, you know, these guys just wanted trouble. But I'm glad that I went through all that because it taught me so much. I mean, back then, I, I never knew I had, like, body dysmorphia. These guys were setting up fake accounts. I was a lot slimmer back then as well, so I've got a fat lip. Um, see, when I like was training and quite slim and pulling mad faces, if I put a mad face, you could see my fat lip. Right. And these guys just zoned in on your weaknesses, man. 
like birth marks and stuff like just see when you've got body dysmorphia or you don't <coughs> believe in yourself like talking about a birth mark might be stupid right but when you're self-conscious yeah. like that would really affect me mm -hmm. but then i'm also glad that i went through that now i'm glad that mm -hmm. i went through that because when i get trolled now and i've done therapy you learn about things like project it's all projection mm -hmm. yeah it's all projection so and now the laws have changed with trolls like i get trolled during lockdown and i had to go to the police right. and it was pretty terrifying but it didn't affect me it was worse than the guys from vine and it didn't affect me as much because yeah. i was able to think i've done therapy so what's happening here and then i went to the police and yeah but now i just enjoy it and when i get trolled now it's nothing much it's people just saying you're shite and stuff okay. is that the camera beeping yeah. is that he's got a darkness inside him if the camera better not cut out again is this mine no all oh, right okay i was gonna say similar <laughs> yeah i think we probably both start with a, a similar image so we'll do it let's week this round for you oh yes <laughs> fucking yes that's a good first reaction i'm gonna draw you while you're looking at these photos oh yeah because we're portraying a podcast we've once done portraiture Mm -hmm. um so yep. what you've got closest to you is uh daryl daryl's efforts of paul black who i think was episode paul five did i say black there yeah uh, i'm thinking of a uh, uh, previous but um so yeah daryl's quite good by pen um paul's efforts eh, i won't say anything negative about it but um if that doesn't give you body dysmorphia i don't know what will <laughs> <laughs> it's that like fucking baked potato with monoblock shirt on it's like my <laughs> little jeremy beetle hand <laughs> And then, uh, <laughs> then there's, there's my effort. <laughs> and then there's uh, my effort, Paul. And um, I don't if you if you don't know what Paul looks like, he doesn't look anything like that. Yeah, I don't think anybody does. That's like Mick Hucknell. <laughs> yeah, that's like a Vic and Bob sketch. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. so thankfully um, we're slightly better with cameras than we are with. Well, actually, no, that was very good with pen. I'll give him that. Don't don't put fucking pressure on. <laughs> <laughs> He's working on you a purple pen. So this is a uh, this is our trip up to what, what was the park we were in here? Queens. Park. Yeah, so it's Queens Park. Um, this is Sunday afternoon, and we had some lovely. We were enveloped in some autumnal colours. So classic uh, easing in pose. Yes. Oh, here I like that. Sort of quite contemplative in nature. Mm -hmm. With my Vaseline hair. With your Vaseline hair. <laughs> <laughs> you would never know if some if you hadn't said in that day, there would have been no idea that. Yeah. Uh, you was it, did you just go into a tub? And yeah. Literally just wetted my hair a wee bit and just a scoop of Vaseline. I was totally flustered that day, by the way. See, the first 15 minutes I was talking to you, I was like, I need a coffee. And, like, you really didn't totally come across good. as being <laughs> flustered. <laughs> That's a nice photo. I like that. I don't, these, you can use these for whatever you, you would like to use them. You can mm -hmm. print them off and give them as um, Christmas presents to people. Yes. <laughs> to my trolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a. A look of what's that smell on this yeah and if i was gonna order these and i haven't but there's another one at, towards the end of you um you sort of look almost looking like you're sniffing your fingers oh no <laughs> yeah we can delete we can delete that one <laughs> like that i think well. yeah you were closing gladiator at this point <laughs> yeah a russell yeah. crow yeah i look like russell crow now have you seen him recently i haven't no yeah i've not seen him either yeah he's fucked <laughs> you're not fucked you're he's bust, fucked he's a bust couch <laughs> i mean i get that all the time people say i look like a fat robbie williams i'm like still robbie williams still robbie williams take that every day of the week <laughs> <laughs> take that hey <laughs> <laughs> my brain nearly fucking melted there realizing what i just said i am here i'm using that for tinder <laughs> <laughs> we're just finding the soundboard. <laughs> a comedian should never celebrate a joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
Pretty nice. Then we're just uh, le- f- leaning into the colours and the... I fucked this. Oh, really? The nice colours and the beech trees. That's I know Darren likes, uh, likes it when I tell him what, what kind of foliage we're working with on a particular day. That is impressive. I think, for me, this was... This was my favourite, and I'm not. I couldn't really give you a good reason why, but I think it's it's quite nice the colours that frame it, and there's something to the symmetry of it, which uh, was appealing to me. So for, for me, that was my favourite of my my lot. Not that it means a great deal. No, but, um, it's lovely. Just a kind of cheeky wee expression as we kind of had a wee saunter down the hill, and uh, there were some nice some people. Down. Uh, got some really nice shots of uh, the kind of skyscape of Glasgow looking down over there. Yeah. Um, we were sitting quite high, quite high, quite high up on the hill there. A black and white. Yeah, yeah. I like that. No, you like a, a black and white, but um, the previous ones, the the colours. I like that one. Um, the colours just required to be left. Um, then I've got another one here. This yeah, was this was the. I'm even sitting like that. <laughs> like that. Mm. I was gonna r- arrange these so that that was the one that came before the sort of smell face. Yeah. Just. <laughs> and then look out! My also smelling my fingers there. No, that, that's more of a sort of praying, a praying pose. Yeah, I look like a proper old school British wrestler, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I was taking my inspiration a little bit from. Uh, our own Daryl Buchanan for the, these few shots. You you always take a a much closer up portrait than I do. I tend to be quite quite wide in terms of like um, getting the sort of upper the torso in. So I, I kind of try to go in a bit closer. And I like your side eye in this one. Let's uh, <laughs> and I asked you to do it again. We never and I it, I actually got it in this one, but it never quite captured the same sort of. Uh, I'm not sure what the expression is. Confusion. Yeah. Because I, I sort of just had an idea. <laughs> <laughs> and it's percolating in the mind what how you're going to enact it. Oh, you can and, I'll, and I'll just light the eyes here. I think this is when I asked you to, uh, to, do, the, to do the face again. <laughs> and that was the... Uh, we got a sort of more sort of slightly manic kind of crazed look behind the eyes. <laughs> And then we had a few in front of this, um, the container that we finished on. And I went for a slightly different kind of colour grade for these, just as uh, just to throw in a little bit more interest. And I think the next one is, uh, it looks as if you're about to go and punch somebody because you got your fist, cl- fist clenched. Yeah. There's a sort of, I'm going to do that. That's nice. Oh, aye. Uh, and then just uh, a, a, Big nice, a, nice, a nice smiley. Happy, go lucky kind of portrait. I think that's my last one to finish on. I think that's my favourite. I like that one. Yeah, that's that's my set. So I'll. David's. I'll, oh yeah. What? <laughs> nah. We've got them. Oh. Go for it. There's two. There's two lots of Davids. There's behind the scenes David, and there's uh, David David. Unless you want to go now, Daryl, and I'll switch with David as you describe yours. Sure. I accidentally just drew Sanjeev. I think this was terrible. <laughs> I tried to do the bobby glasses and then I fucked it. I've never been with a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> to the moon and back, baby. Is it enter? Yeah. Hang on. <clears throat> okay, so we've got a few warm up shots um, with. So we've got a sponsor, mpb.com. Which is like a you you can trade in camera gear basically, uh, but they're very like plastic free package and everything like that. They're a great company. MPB is the largest global platform to buy, sell, and trade used photography and videography kit. They are the simple, safe, and circular way to trade, upgrade, and get paid for kit. MPB is not a marketplace. 
They buy kit directly from visual storytellers and their product specialists evaluate all items before reselling them. Every item is MPB approved, so you never question the quality of products. Use code PORTRAIT20 for 20% off all Bullish Coffee products at bullishcoffeecompany.co.uk. Um, so the first lens that we had was a 16 to 35 mil wide lens, one I'm not really... Uh, what do you call it? Adept with. So there's a few of these warm up shots looking seriously, just sussing out what I'm doing. And then this is the, the birthmark shot you wanted Wine Port. Wine Port. Wine Port Mafia. <laughs> WPM, baby. And then we were using the wide lens for what it's meant to be used for slight fish eye kind of uh, looking very happy some lines in the background create some interest but just the kind of weird perspective of the lines can you see that okay yeah that's nice size of my fucking forehead man it is a fish eye lens though nice. it's gonna do that <laughs> I feel like if you had a size 15 shoe there would be space left <laughs> 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 I tried to make all the guests have a big forehead so I don't feel so bad <laughs> 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 this is your steps you wanted in. Oh, wow. It's, it's not a photo to shout about, but I, I couldn't leave it out. Wow, man. Oh, wow. It's a lot of steps. And then the next photos are all with the 85 mil, which I think I'm more comfortable with. Uh, so we have the... It's, it's almost like a Hardy Boys pose. Ralph Alton cover. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sweet. Porno on the hood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, just Absolutely looking lovely. Very wholesome about that. Yeah, wholesome, wholesome Bobby Dazzle. Bra Brady Bunch like. <laughs> I like that man. This is you in Lord of the Rings. Hi. <laughs> I like that. That's nice. And that's one for a story. So mo all the uh, crops like this are usually five by four for Insta, and then I just had another photo, so I made it like story format if you wanted it for anything yeah and then I like, that. I like the the last few photos I think uh, so this is through the leaves and um, I think we've got you to stand there for ages telling you to <laughs> move forward and back and all that is that when I was talking shit about kimchi oh yes. I think so yeah <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's good for you I got health and all that <laughs> as well like hipsters walking past us I started saying a fact about Korea just because I'd heard that Bobby Lee said in a podcast that morning and just stole the knowledge as if it was mine. I'm like, oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favourites. <laughs> the garden. <laughs> Do you have a voice to go with that? <laughs> it looks like a Libby voice, doesn't it? Yeah. Like a face Libby would pull. <laughs> In your mouth, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> I took, that took a turn I wasn't expecting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like that. I like, yeah, it was a nice one of you, I think. Yeah. Nice eyes. you got a very nice face. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It's quite a strange uh, editing photos of someone you don't really know because you have to get, you've got their oh, face like on your laptop stuff. there. Yeah, yeah, it's very yeah. personal thing. <laughs> the people's eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> and then this was a, a couple with a glass prism. Just sort of up here, I was just kind of putting around the edge of the camera. It's a little triangular prism and it gets like different reflections and light. Sometimes it looks good, sometimes it looks crap. I think that looks really cool. Though. Really? The effect. You're contemplating something there. Yeah. Yeah. Just seeing someone go by with a coffee, like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that Margaret? <laughs> <laughs> and that one, the light was catching you, making you look a bit pale. I didn't want to. Yeah. I didn't want to tangle you up. I look like I've I just like woke up. <laughs> <laughs> woke up in the park. And this was in the. Uh, what do you call that bit? With the stage. Bandstand. The bandstand, yeah. And then we moved to a, a box with graffiti on it. I like these ones, I think. Yeah, that's nice. 
Oh, like that. Cool. How was the photo experience with three folk with cameras just following you about? <laughs> it was quite strange. I felt quite, I felt a bit uncomfortable. Okay. I didn't really know what to do. Mm -hmm. I was kind of leaning towards the comedy side of things, but yeah. then I was like, I don't know what to do here. But yeah. it, was, it was nice to actually do it because it's something that I just would never, ever do. Yeah. So I, I stood out. I was outside my comfort zone, but I felt very beneficial. Cool. For me. Uh, it's a strange, because I think as soon as the camera's there, we, we just get zoned in, but we're forgetting like, okay, there's someone standing there and there's people going by and they're like, what, what's happening here? Yeah. But I, I didn't even think about anyone going by until after. I was like, oh yeah. But um, yeah, because yeah, we were chatting like, what do you want these for? Is it comedy? Is it normal photos? Is it, I don't know. Yeah. But um, yeah, hopefully I got a good mix. Oh, there's a couple of belters in there that I could use seriously for like social media and headshots cool. and stuff. And then black and white, because you mentioned you liked David's black and white, so I thought I'd provide yeah. you the one. And that was the, the side view of yeah. your front view. You can tell I've got Vaseline on my hair there. <laughs> <laughs> You're smelling it on your fingers aye. as well. Like, mm. <laughs> oh, aye. <laughs> Why can I smell... Sh no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it smell like Stuart's finger? <laughs> 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 a slight bit of rainbow in your raging at it Robert De Niro yeah. <laughs> how many photos do I have? I thought I was done what the hell? that's quite a lot of photos that's like a, this is like an author yeah, yeah. So you get a book. testimonial yeah, yeah the Dazzler Diaries hi <laughs> our, our group of friends so the primary school I went to Dunfoot used to get a Dunfoot Dazzler a wee gold certificate and we've got like a rival school the Alloway Allowegians, we're the Dunfoot Dazzlers. So I love the, the Dazzler chat. You can just cut that all out. That was the last photo. <laughs> yeah, that is like a book, a book cover. The fridge years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll be able to see if the Luddites go black or white. <laughs> so I'll have the free view for oh, yeah. yeah. I think, I think you'd probably know better, you'd Mac, for your work, right? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is where I um, didn't actually know we were showing my photos off. So I can Sorry. Just, like a surprise. Improv. Uh, oh no, these are your ones. Sorry. Uh, I've just saw Darren Connell images and I'm like, oh. There we go. Right, I've got to resize my thing. Let me see my normal, like my MacBook I used for the micro photos. Um, it's so old it doesn't have this function. It opens all the images separately. Here we go. So uh, I was there under the pretense of taking behind the scenes photos, but I was also being a cheeky wee bugger and getting some not so behind the scenes photos. So I, you were, I think at this point you were chatting to Daryl, but this is you sort of doing the, the yeah. sort of Jonathan Frakes with the way, you, you know, <laughs> the way he kind of stands. Um, so there's that one. And the uh, the tree root, and that's another alternate angle to your <laughs> your wrestler pose, just with more leaves. Yeah. Um, that's your did you eye? Hi, the sinner. That's very uh, sinister. Hi. Very sinister. <laughs> just hiding in the bush. Hi. <laughs> With a wee smile as well. It's <laughs> just the, the, the curl of the lip there. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> just, hmm, someone went past the Kimichi. <laughs> Is this a conquer tree? <laughs> <laughs> Try again, my conquer. <laughs> um, ah, there we go. That's your, that's your pointing. You're kind of channeling Marlon Brando because we were talking about Marlon Brando yeah. as well, weren't we? Yeah. So this is your. Come to me in the day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> yeah. Just wait a wee minute here. Give me a minute to think. <laughs> um, oh, and it's, uh, it's like I, I took like a whole burst mode of them, so there were a couple of you just started to talk as well. Could have made a wee gif of them. Yeah. Animate it. Um, this, this is you looking to strewn. So we, I think that we call this a wee side profile. That's why it's 
Vaseline. Who's you get the Vaseline? <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's just a wee, a wee portrait. Right on. That, I nice. think. Oh, yeah. I like that. That's kind of that's nice. Pensive. That was a good wee backdrop. That we will. Yeah, yeah. With the the graffiti. So there we go. Yeah, we were at. Just for so anyone's information, we're at Queen's Park in the south side. Um, started at the side near the garage. Just kind of did a wee wander up the hill and then down towards the, the bandstand and then the duck pond with the wee uh, graffiti thing. But yeah, it was uh, it was great fun. And uh, thanks for coming out. Really yeah. appreciate it, man. Yeah, it was a great time. You're a good bunch of lads. I do appreciate it. We started talking through lockdown as well, so it's nice to actually... Yeah, it's been ages. It was cool to go full circle and actually do something. Yeah, I think it was after yeah after seeing your podcast and stuff and just seemed like a dead sound guy, really funny and considering the podcast, but not really sure what to do at that time. You just I think you were one of the first people I reached out to. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember waiting to pick up Amanda and you'd sent like a voice note back. I was like, yeah, <laughs> getting down calm, but yes. Oh. That was a microphone, I swear. <laughs> Quite a good way to end it. Hi. Yeah, <laughs> um, I've got I, some Vaseline for that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, cheers, Darren. Cheers, yeah. Daryl. Yeah, cheers, cheers to Drew. <laughs> cheers, Rab. Cheers, Rab. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rab on the decks. But, yeah. um, I thanks very much for coming down. Looking forward to next few episodes of Straight White Well and seeing what you do next. And see, before you go, you were you were talking about, are you considering, <sighs> my mind's doing 10 things at once. Right. Well, actually, boy, what you're thinking, where can people catch you for the, the podcast, like social media, what platforms are you on? So my podcast is called Straight White Well, mm -hmm. and you can get it everywhere that you can find a podcast, the usual places, mm -hmm. Spotify, Apple Podcasts and stuff. And then my Twitter is Darren Connell eighty seven, or just put in Darren Connell comedian, and my Facebook is Darren Connell as well. So you can add us or follow me. No bother. Nice. That was a good professional bit to put in. That we always forget to do. <laughs> um, when you're saying you get just one last question before we wrap up, if that's all right. You're yeah. saying you get bored of material sometimes. You've been doing it for a while. So I know like comedians that I listen to say like in America they'll get bored of it and then they'll do a special. So that's it, locked in. It's in something they've delivered, move on to the next stuff. You don't have a special out, right? No. So how does it, what, do you just let material go that could have been gold or are you working towards a special just now? I would love to film a special next year. So we penciled in the pavilion, but we haven't confirmed it yet. Okay. I'm, I'm at a stage, I'm just like, do I do the pavilion where it's, all of a sudden, I just become stressed about ticket sales, or mm. should I find a venue like Blackfriars and just try to make it the best possible show that I can think of? Mm. So all the stuff that I would be sick of that I've probably not done in years, I mm. would put that in the special, film it to the best my to the best of my abilities, and then release it as a special. I've got a special in me anyway. I've been doing this for so long that it's time to do it, and I just. I need to think about the process of, um, like where, because I don't want it to be about money or or mm. anything like that. Even though the pavilion is amazing, so I'll need to have a think about it. But absolutely, the goal is next year to do a, to do a special. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. And I yeah, genuinely mean it. Like the the podcast and your comedy is absolutely outstanding. And uh, yeah, really. I think a special would be amazing. Look forward to seeing it and thank you very much for coming down. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, Trips. Thank you, Trips. That was me impersonating the soundboard. <laughs> 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 there is a clap one somewhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I, should, I should try and find it. Uh, uh, it was <coughs> great. Oh,